It is good to have you joining with us for this time of worship at the end of another busy day. I don't know how it has been for you today, but each day brings its ups and its downs, sometimes maybe more downs than ups. Each day brings its challenges. Um, There are times when we feel we might have done better. There are times when maybe the careless word spoken without thought uh, has led us into further trouble and difficult situations. But in spite of all our shortcomings, there are the successes of today that while we get the credit, yet we realize it's by the guiding hand of God who is more than willing to give us the credit even when we don't deserve it. However, we feel at the end of the day, let us step aside for this brief time, assured of God's pardon, certain of his goodness, and know the sheer delight of being in his presence, in his sanctuary. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. God of all grace and Father of all mercies, we humbly bow in your presence, acknowledge that you're with us, even when we fail to realize it. Thank you, Father, for the opportunities to drink from the cup of your provision. Thank you for the health and strength that has seen us through today. Loving Father, we thank you for this season of Lent, speeding us on to the celebration of Easter, that time when, looking to Calvary and the empty cross, we're reminded of a risen Savior. And let the message of Easter, that transforming message, breathe new life into all of us, who so easily lose faith and become despondent like the two men on the Emmaus road with Jesus. Give us comfort, Lord, from the response of the disciples of the Easter message who were slow to accept the truth until the quickening spirit of the Holy Spirit turned the world upside down. As you have made yourself known to the disciples of old, show yourself to us in days of unbelief and doubt. Lord, we speak to you through the world of nature, You declare the wonder of your creation in the beautiful flowers of spring, the wonderful songs of the birds proclaiming the dawning of a new day, and also watching the frolicking of the lambs in the field, skipping for joy and enjoying their freedom. For these and all your wonderful things, Lord, that speak to us of your creation, we give you joy and thanks. How privileged we are to live in a world that comes to us through this miracle of creation. May it be our joy to join the heavenly chorus and shout for joy to all the earth that you are Lord of all creation, that you've crowned your creation uh, above all when you made us share the joy of the resurrection message through Jesus Christ from the grave. As we turn, Father, to your word tonight, guide us by your Holy Spirit so that we may not only hear what you are saying, but might find in that word a word of comfort for sadness, a word of challenge for carelessness, and also a word of celebration for all that has been done to bring about your redemption through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
reading comes to us from the book of Psalms, the Psalm number 42. And um, the title of this Psalm is, it's uh, to the dedicated to the sons of Korah, who in fact were the musicians responsible for conducting the music and the singing in the temple of old. And here is how the psalmist writes. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my God and my Savior. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Mount Hermon, to the Mount of Midzar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my, souls ta as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down on my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks to him for it. One of the lines from a 1990s song, Bing Brown Eyes, has the well-known refrain, it takes a worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. I went across the river, I went down to sleep, I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. We're told that a lot of people are worrying in these days, these days of uncertainty in which we're living, as we cope with the pandemic. Back in 1965, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the pastor of Westminster Chapel. He had been a qualified doctor in Wales, but went on to become one of the great preachers in London. His claim to fame is he wrote a book with the title Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cure. Now, the success of this book was symptomatic of many in our society, even in the church community, who find the challenges and the trials of life hard to face. <clears throat> We're being told that one of the side effects of the pandemic uh, is, that has engulfed our nation over the past years is a serious increase in mental illnesses of all sorts, whether it's anxiety about health, fear for jobs, or the stress of having to spend so much time cooked up at home. Depression of all sorts is nothing new. It's been around, it's been around for a long time. One of the stories we associate with Lent tells us how our Lord was faced in a similar situation of isolation as he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, devoid of food and drink, tested by Satan and tempted by him. The gospel writer tells us that after it was all over, angels came and ministered to him. Back in the Old Testament, that 42nd Psalm that we read describes the symptoms of being downcast and in the dumps in detail. But also it goes on to offer us help to cope with them. The psalmist's back, when faced with such crisis, he offers us at the end of the psalm hope, 
In verse 11, he says, Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. For the psalmist, his present circumstances are not the last word in life's drama. As the late Captain Sir Tom Moore shared with us before his death, tomorrow will be better. But sometimes it's hard to believe this. Or what about the advice of Paul the Apostle? I has not seen, neither has entered the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love him. Could it be the reason why so many are troubled in these days? Because they're looking for help in the wrong direction. This particular psalm, used and written for the sons of Korah, that group of Levites responsible for the temple music. Now, what were the things that weighed so heavily on their minds of the author as he shared with them? The first thing he says, there is the forced absence from the temple where God is worshipped. He says, my soul thirsts for God. We all know what it is to be thirsty in a hot, dry day. But it's clear from the psalmist that he is not at home. He's far from Jerusalem, far from the temple, and he felt cut off from God. Notice how he longs for the, for the worship of God's house. As the metrical psalm puts it, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. It doesn't follow from what he says that he's lost faith in God, nor does he question the belief that God is everywhere or that God isn't with him. Rather, as those charged with leading the praise and music of God's house, he felt he was failing to do what God had asked him to do. He had the gift of song, but he wasn't using his gift to serve God. As I visit members of this congregation by phone call or letter, the one refrain that keeps cropping up again and again is how they miss the worship of the sanctuary week by week. Recently, I read a comment that troubled me coming from a devout Roman Catholic. He expressed his fear that once life would return to normal, people would no longer have the desire to return to church because they'd got used to sitting on the sofa in front of the television in their pajamas. <clears throat> Hasn't that been happening already before the pandemic? People have lost their longing to be in God's house on the Lord's day. Living in a, an increasingly secular age where God has no longer given his place, there are those who would maintain that the reason why God has permitted us to go through the experiences of the past year is that we might learn again. Without God, we cannot live. And without God, we dare not die. It was so different from the psalmist. Let's pray that the loss of worship week by week over the past months may generate within each one of us that longing, that thirst for the things of God, <clears throat> a passion that brings us back with new commitment to God's house and the worship of his sanctuary. The forced absence from the temple, but then there were the taunts of the unbelievers. Where is your God? The insults they slung at them. It's clear that the psalmist found himself in a pagan and unbelieving environment where the ordinary man in the street was living a life in which God had no part. Mind you, had God delivered for his people, the taunters would have been more than happy to cash in on the benefits they were enjoying. They were proud of all that God had done for them and in the past. Now his reputation and good name were at stake. Isn't this a question that bothers many today through the pandemic? Where is God in all this? That's the extent to which many believe in God in our time. Life generally is all about socializing with your mates, having a good time, living it up. God is the spare wheel carried for emergencies only. But God will either be God of all or Lord of none. 
as our Savior tells us, no man can serve two masters. <clears throat> it's easy to follow God when everything is going our way. But the message of Easter has at its heart a cross. Far too many are more than happy to enjoy the good times and the good things. But the least hint of trouble, people run for cover and distance themselves as far away as possible. I wonder if many had been in today's society, had been asked to take Simon of Cyrene's place in the carrying the cross, how would they have felt? I believe it would have been one of the greatest disasters of their lives and something they would never get over. Where is your God? It's a challenging question for all of us at this season of Lent. <clears throat> but thirdly, the other thing that uh, troubled them was memories of better days. The things I remember how I used to go with the multitudes to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving. This appetite for God, as C.S. Lewis called it, had all the spontaneity of a natural and physical desire. Which of us have not gone out from a service, finishing with a rousing hymn, and we go out humming it to ourselves? Or maybe we've tuned into songs of praise, and there's been a peace that has touched us. Or maybe Richard Yar's request program on a Sunday afternoon that has made us all feel so much the better. My favorite hymn is one I associate with Easter. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou or death hast won. In those words, there's one of the greatest declarations of life beyond death. And it finishes on those reassuring words of proclamation. No more we doubt thee, glorious Prince of life. Life is not without thee. Aid us in our strife. Make us more than conquerors through thy deathless love. Bring us safe through Jordan to thy home above. In that confidence I live, and with that confidence I will faith death without fear, sure of God's provision for my future. I am more than pleased to trust my life in the Savior's hands. In normal times, Adelaide and I used to make a point of attending the annual performance of the Messiah uh, in, the, in Belfast. And if ever there was anything to lift you to the heights above, was surely the Hallelujah Chorus. Such memories <clears throat> are more than capable of helping us through the dark, difficult days we experience. Not only are the memories of other days, better days, but also there are the overwhelming trials of life. There's many a person who can identify with verse 7. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. Especially for those who over the past months have found their life under threat from the coronavirus. Lying in the intensive care unit, of a hospital struggling for the very breathe that breath the, the draw and wondering if the next one will be their last. When death stares you in the face, it may be in despair, but one is driven to face the God of eternity and realize he is our only hope. The hymn writer puts it better than I can when he says, Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief and pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, your best, your heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Times of testing come to us as part of life's package. But let's not resent them. For they are for our good, and they give us an insight into what our Savior bore for us when he hung on Calvary's tree. And finally, there's the failure of God to deliver us sooner. 
We are impatient creatures at heart, and it's so easy to lose heart and cry out in despair when we imagine everything is against us. Remember our Lord on the cross, who knew what it was to face this human wall of desperation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If God were to pamper us as spoiled children, would there ever be a time when we could adequately appreciate what he does for us day by day? We can only come to know the wonder of deliverance when we have been bound hand and foot, unable to help ourselves. There's many a time when we cry out, yet we are more than capable of helping ourselves, but are more than happy to let somebody else help us. If we took to heart the the advice of Robert Bridges, we would behave like men and women of faith rather than spoiled and pampered children. All my hope on God is founded. All my trust he shall renew. He my guide through changing order, only good and only true. The soldier, by the very nature of his calling, is trained for battle. And he knows that when the battle breaks out, he must fight. God has skilled us to live for him. So we have no right to expect our way through life and not accept the difficulties with the joys, not to expect only the ups and not accept the downs, to be ready for pain and suffering and not to expect it's a time of trial. It does us all good to return thanks to God for the blessings of every day that we take for granted. <clears throat> we assume they're ours by right, but God, out of his goodness and love, has given us out of his bounty. The wilderness experience to which our Savior was subjected was his preparation for the ministry on which he was to embark. And if we are to be his disciples, can we expect to find life any different for us? There will be times when we discover to our cost. We have a nasty feeling Not everything is going our way. So, Martin Lloyd-Jones suggests, take ourselves in hand when we find the wind on our faces and ask the question, why are you cast down, O my soul? In this sinful, evil world, there can be no hope outside of God. He's the God who was the same yesterday, remains the same today and will remain the same tomorrow. His purposes for me haven't changed. If he stood by me in the past, he will be with me for the battles and for that which is yet to come. Let us therefore put on the whole armor of God and face the world and the devil in the confidence that victory is ours because the one who is for us never fails. Is there a cure for days like these when life's burdens are weighing us down? Yes, there is. The 43rd Psalm tells us, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I wonder, have you been struggling against the odds over the past months? It's not cod liver oil you need to feel better. It's the presence and strength of God with you and beside you. If God be for us, who can be against us? If he did not spare his only son for our salvation, do you imagine he will let us sink without coming and reaching out the hand of rescue? If God be for us, who can be against us? Let me finish with a quotation from a little book that fell my desk the other day. It's written by a man called Pablo Martinez. He says, A formidable crescendo of promises assures us that God is for us and with us. I will rescue him. I will protect him. I will answer him. 
I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. With these solemn yet heartwarming promises, the journey from fear to trust ends. The psalmist is safe. He dwells under the shadow of the Almighty. This is our faith and our hope. Your life and my life is not at the mercy of a virus, but in the hands of Almighty God. This is not a place for triumphalism, but there's certainly triumph. It's the triumph that the resurrection of Christ assures us with the victory over evil and death. It's the same Christ who tells us today, Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What better news is there in days like these? And what better hope have we for the days to come? Let us join together in prayer. Loving Father and gracious Lord, ere the light of another day turns to the darkness of night, grant us the joy of a peaceful sleep and a body refreshed for the duties and tasks that tomorrow brings. Gracious Lord, if tomorrow we are asked to travel the road of unexpected challenge and disappointment, help us to face them believing that nothing that ever happens is outside the ken of a sovereign God, whose we are and whom we can trust. Grant us to know, Lord, that there are times when we need to enter the school of life, because in spite of all the way whereby we have traveled through the years, there are still the lessons we need to learn, the disappointments we have to accept as part of your plan for our lives. There are the knocks and bruises we have suffered and felt we didn't deserve them, and so we have grumbled and complained. Remind us yet again, Father, that we're in the hands of a loving God. He knows our limitations, but also our capabilities. He knows how far we can manage on our own, as well as the stubbornness that refuses to admit that we need help. Loving Lord, during the past months, you have taken us into a situation where we've seen the foundations of our world shaken by something we couldn't see and over which we had no control. Even then, you did not abandon us to despair because you have endowed certain people in our society with skills and knowledge that have enabled them to offer hope to replace despair and a way forward when everything looks as if it's lost. Thank you, Lord, for the scientists who are tireless in their pursuit of new discoveries to relieve our pain and persist in to find answers to life complexities. Guide, Lord, with wisdom all who have the thankless task of managing the health of our nation and all who have to cope with challenges to their decisions. We remember thanksgiving our doctors and nurses and managers in the health service. May they be open to the guidance of your Holy Spirit and decisions they make for the good of all. Give to our politicians the humility that accepts there's a higher good than party politics, as well as the need to put the good of others before political dreams. <clears throat> On this anniversary day, Lord, we remember those for whom life's earthly journey came to an end because of the virus, leaving an empty chair that brings a tear to the eye, as well as a disappointment to those who could not join them in life's closing moments. Lord, be with those who find themselves in residential care, sometimes not of their own choosing. Give them the grace to see this as part of your plan for their comfort and care. Give to the managers and staff the patience to respect the dignity of those in their care, the patience when they feel misunderstood, and the moods that make life difficult for those for whom they care. Bless family members 
unable to spend prime time with their loved ones, and in particular those for whom the long weeks of separation have meant that the memory of their loved one has become blurred and maybe even forgotten those who were their nearest and dearest. Lord, we commit these issues which divide us as a community <clears throat> and pray that wisdom and understanding might prevail. Lord, we know we live in a sinful world with many in our midst for whom law and order is disregarded, who thrive on creating mischief. May their disguided pursuits give them no joy and lead to a road that leads to nowhere. May they learn the folly of their ways and through your Holy Spirit lead them in a better way. Loving Father, let us not be unmindful of the many in our congregation who live alone. But Lord, we bless you for those ministering angels in the community whose watchful eye and offers of help are such a blessing. Be with those who are taking practical steps to address all who are in real need through unemployment in these days. We thank you for the organization Christians Against Poverty. Bless those who man the provision centers and are ever vigilant for cares for cases of real need. For those who are humbled by admitting the need and come to realize that this is the fulfilling of your promise inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my children, you have done it unto me. Hasten the day, Lord Jesus, when we will see the lessons that the pandemic has taught us, lived out in every community. Help us afresh to see your presence at work through these uncertain days when many turn their back on you rather than see all that has come to pass as part of your overall plan for us as a society. Through our helplessness, lead us to learn afresh the hard lessons of life that prepare us for the coming of your kingdom and your will for us as a people, stubborn to learn and full of the selfishness that blinds us to see a better way if your kingdom is to come in its fullness. Lord, these things we ask in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has taught us as a family of your people to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
And now, into God's gracious care and keeping, we commit you. May his grace, mercy, and peace be with you and remain with you this night and always. Oh.